To preserve our independence, we must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. We must make our choice between economy and liberty or profusion and servitude. Wow. I place economy among the first and most important of Republican virtues, and public debt is the greatest of the dangers to be feared. It is incumbent on every generation to pay its own debts as it goes. We must have a central bank to secure this country's finances. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their money, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of their property until their children will wake up homeless on the very continent their fathers conquered. Jefferson, you're mad. This country will have a central bank. Okay, so did you ever wonder why the national debt keeps going up and up? Me too. Well, what I'm going to share with you um, was written by a Dr. Ken Mata, or Mato, M A T T O, and his site I'm including in the description, and it's called Zion of Zion. Pretty catchy, if you ask me. Now, one of the most ungodly and fraudulent institutions ever perpetrated on the American people, and the world for that matter, is unequivocally the Federal Reserve System, which through deceit became the central bank of the United States in 1913. Now the idea came about a meeting in Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia in 1910. Now the bankers in this country, especially J.P. Morgan, created a currency panic in 1907 in order to get the American people to accept the idea of a central bank. Wow, how nice of them. Now, Central Bank already existed in England for as far back as 1694. The Rothschilds completely dominate the banking system. Um, if you're awake, you already know that. If you're not, let me come as a surprise to you. Now, it's estimated their wealth goes into the trillions. Now, you know how much Oprah's couple billion compared to Bill Gates's 80 billion. He loses a couple billion daily in stock. If, Put a little perspective there for you. I talk about Oprah, I talk about Bill Gates, okay? If Bill Gates woke up tomorrow with Oprah's money, he'd jump out of the window. He slid his throat on the way down, I can't even put gas in my plane. Um, Baron Nathan Meyer, our mayor Rothschilds, um, was quoted as saying, I care not what puppet is placed upon the throne of England to rule the empire on which the sun never sets. The man that controls Britain's money supply controls the British empire, and I control the British money supply. So the idea of the central bank is essentially to enslave the people of the country to a debt money system that you continue to collect taxes continuously which just covers the interest. I mean, everybody knows what a credit card is, right? If you don't pay it off and you've got a decent interest rate, say 18, 19%, you're gonna be paying that off for probably 20 years before a couple thousand dollars or whatever you have on your card is paid off. I mean, that really puts it into perspective just how much more you're paying on the card ultimately than you actually put on the card. Now the dupe people of the United States are paying about $400 billion a year to the IRS. 
which is the collection agency for the Federal Reserve, by the way. Now, the Federal Reserve is a privately owned bank with 10 private members, in case you didn't know. The Chase Manhattan Bank is a member which is owned by the Rockefellers, who are Rothschild agents. Now at this point, the citizens of the United States falsely owe these lemmings over roughly $20 trillion now, thanks to Obama administration that du doubled the debt in his eight years. He didn't only double the debt, he added more debt than all previous presidential administrations combined. All of them. <laughs> That's a lot. Anyway. Have you ever asked the question, who has that much money to loan to the United States? Well, now, the year which doomed the world economy was 1694. The government of King William II sorry, was in desperate need of money. And when learning of the situation, a man named William Patterson put together a cartel of wealthy men, of which he was the leader. Now, Patterson and his cronies agreed to loan the king 1.2 million pounds sterling, which would have been approximately $6 million at 8% interest per annum, on the conditions that the king would grant two things. One of his conditions was he would grant Patterson and his associates a charter which would name them the Bank of England. And his other condition, this bank shall have the sole exclusive right to issue notes to the fullest extent of its capital. Now, the people were having a problem with their gold and silver coins of which the banks, bankers quickly came to the rescue. The solution is aptly described by Professor Carol Quigley in his book, Tragedy and Hope. For generations, men had sought to avoid the one drawback of gold, its heaviness. I mean, nobody probably has enough gold that I'm speaking to right now to even worry about how heavy it is. But if you have one bar of gold, you know just how heavy one bar is. So can, you can just imagine what 1.2 million pounds would feel like. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm sure everybody listening would like to have that problem and potentially be forced to find a way to solve that problem because it's a good problem to have. Anyway, by using pieces of paper to represent specific pieces of gold, today we call such pieces of paper gold certificates. Such certificates entitled its bearer to exchange it for pieces of gold on demand. But in view of convenience of paper, only a small fraction of certificate holders ever did make such demands. Now, it early became clear that gold need be held on hand only to the amount needed to cover the fraction of certificates, likely to be presented for payment. Accordingly, the rest of the gold could be used for business purposes, or what amounts to the same thing. A volume of certificates could be issued greater than the volume of gold reserved for a payment, such an excess volume of paper claims against reserves we now call banknotes. In effect, this creation of paper claims greater than the reserve available means that bankers are creating money out of nothing. Thin air. Just like that. Boom. Go some more money here. Here you go. Now the king literally granted the Bank of England the legal right to print all the money that would be used in commerce by the people and the government. 
In other words, the Bank of England became the sole money source of any currency that was used in English commerce by either the people or the government. Now, if they needed more money, they simply printed it. As long as you got the ink, paper, how much you need. Now, it's said that by 1698, the British government owed 16 times 10 to the six power pounds. Now, I personally don't know how much that is, but it's probably more than I've ever seen. And I'm willing to bet it's more than any of you have ever seen. Um, they owed that to, uh, to the Bank of England. Now, keep in mind, this was only four years. Now, let's get into the second date of infamy that took place in 1773. Now, in 1773, a wealthy goldsmith and coin dealer named Mayor Amschel Bauer was born in 1743 and died in 1812. He summoned 12 wealthy and influential men to his place of business in Frankfurt, Germany. Now, his purpose for the meeting was to impress upon those men that if they pooled their resources, it was possible to gain control of the wealth, natural resources, and manpower of the entire world. He then outlined a 25-point plan on how to accomplish it, and I'm going to share that with you right now. But before we get into that, I wanted to attempt to splice um, something together with this list. Shut and up! What it is, is I found this video on YouTube. It's a few years old, but I thought it had some pretty good meaning for what I'm doing. Um, basically, it's um, an ex-Jesuit's book that reveals their true agenda back in the 15th century. And it's called Monita Secreta. And it was found in the openlibrary.org catalog, catalog, I guess. And basically, um, the 16th century Jesuit claims true agenda is to gather wealth and power for the Catholic Church at the expense of most vulnerable. So you can compare and compare some parallels to both of these lists because they're ultimately both secret societies right now. And you tell me if any of this sounds familiar, even in relation to this day and age. Number one, use violence and terrorism rather than academic discussions. So it says the greatest possible care must be taken that these instructions do not fall into the hands of strangers. But if this should happen, let it be denied that these are the principles of the society and let such denial be confirmed by those of our members whom we are sure know nothing of them. So it's saying there are some people within the order itself who don't know the ultimate agenda, which makes sense because we know a lot of, um, a lot of secret societies. Number that. two, preach liberalism to usurp political power. Chapter 1, it says, In order to render itself acceptable to the inhabitants of a place, the object of the society will be of great service. It is necessary to discharge the most humble duties in hospitals, to visit the poor and the afflicted and prisoners, that the principal inhabitants may be led to admire and love our people. Number 3, Initiate Class Warfare. And then it says, and cause them to be more liberal towards us. Um, and then it says, all must learn the same outward manner. Be cautious in buying land. Let this be done in the names of some trusty and secret friends. Let the purchases which are adjacent to our colleges be assigned to colleges at a distance, by which means it will be impossible that princes or magistrates can ever have certain knowledge of the revenue of the society. So, I mean, they're trying to hide their revenue and they Number four, politicians must be cunning and deceptive. Any moral code leaves a politician vulnerable. And it says, let the greatest amount be always extorted from widows. Number five, dismantle existing forces of order and regulation. Um, and let what is contained in the Roman treasury be kept secret. And this reminded me of Matthew 23, where it says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, 
hypocrites for you devour widows houses and for a pretense make long prayer um and make long prayer for a pretense i mean that sounds to me like most of the church leaders that are in existence now i mean there's probably a few that are truly sincere but most that i've seen they all use the same vocal inflections while they're doing it so i mean you can tell that they're that they're they are reciting these prayers just to conform to a community. And it actually says that right here in verse 5 of Matthew 23. But all their works they do is to be seen by men. Um, in other words, they're just doing it to be accepted by other people. It says they love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, rabbi, rabbi. And then Isaiah 10 also talks about this. It says, woe to them that decree unrighteous decrees and that write grievousness, which they have prescribed, that widows may be their prey. And then it says, without me, they shall bow under the prisoners and they shall fall under their slain. Because, of course, all throughout the biblical text, it says, okay, their judgment is coming. Number six, remain invisible until the very moment when it has gained such strength that no cunning or force can undermine it. Greatest amount should always be extorted from widows and let what is contained in the Roman treasury be kept secret. Okay, well, everybody knows that the Roman treasury is filthy rich now. Number seven, use mob psychology to control the masses without absolute depotism. Sorry, one cannot rule efficiently. Okay, that one, I mean, if you think about Black Lives Matter or the most recent Charlottesville, Virginia incident, consider that one. Again, use mob psychology to control the masses without absolute depotism. One cannot rule efficiently. And then it says here in chapter 2, every means must be employed at the beginning that we may gain the ears and minds of princes and leading men so that there may not be any who may dare to rise against us. Um, and then it says their evil deeds interpret them favorably under the pretext that is for the common good, not only common. Number eight, advocate the use of alcoholic liquors, drugs, moral corruption, and all forms of vice used systematically by agentures to corrupt the youth. If the prince begins to do anything that's not acceptable, he must be encouraged and urged on. Number nine, seize properties by any means to secure submissions and sovereignty. And it says here, those who are of great authority in the state, they must be used in subduing and restraining the sort of people who are oppressed to our society. So they're gonna use the government um, to get rid of their, their enemies, or which are probably the good people in the world, the people that don't want to be part of it. Number 10. Foment wars and control the peace conferences so that neither of the combatants gain territory, placing them further in debt and therefore into our power. Did you hear that one? Foment wars and control the peace conferences so that neither of the combatants gain territory, placing them further in debt, and therefore into our power. Unbelievably deceptive and malicious. Um, and then it says, let our people so direct princes and illustrious men that they may appear to aim only at the greater glory of God, for their aim must not be must not immediately, but gradually be directed to political and secular dominion. So very slowly over time, they're saying they want to take over the governments, basically. Anyway, number 11, choose candidates for public office who will be servile and obedient to our commands so they may be readily used as pawns in our game. Choose candidates, as in select candidates. This is another one. Um, that's especially bad. It says greater efforts must be made against those who attempt to set up schools for the education of youth. Let it be shown to princes and magistrates that these people will cause disturbance unless they are prevented. It's talking about people that just want to help children. Number 12. Use the press for propaganda to control all outlets of public information while remaining in the shadows, clear of blame. Does that ring a bell in the election campaigns of 2016 
I'll read that again. Use the press for propaganda to control all outlets of public information while remaining in the shadows, Clara Blaine. This says here um, concerning winning over rich widows to the society. It says that they, down here, um, they're going to do all these things that they may be more easily withdrawn from the conversation of visits and, and suitors. So they want these widows to, to remain lonely so they can take all their wealth and property. Um, and then it talks about in what manner widows are to be secured and their property disposed of. So this pretty much explains why Jesus kept talking about widows all the time, saying those who, you know, devour widows' houses. This is it right here. Number 13, make the masses believe they had been the prey of criminals, then restore order to appear as the saviors. Ever hear of order out of chaos? That's exactly what that explains right there. Make the masses believe they had been the prey of criminals, then restore order to appear as the saviors. And then it says here, um, let the mothers be instructed to annoy their children even from infancy with reproofs, castigations, etc. And especially when daughters are grown up, let them be refused ornaments and a parable, apparel sold to them. Number 14. Create financial panics. Use hunger to control to subjugate the masses. That one right there is a prime example of what's been going on in Venezuela for over a year. Then it talks about how they increase their revenue by accentuating those who are poor within their community, but keeping secret those who are wealthy. And I mean, that just shows you that they don't even take care of their own. They simply use their destitute to advance their own agenda. Number 15, infiltrate Freemasonry to take advantage of the Grand Orient Lodges to cloak the true nature of their work in philanthropy. Spread their atheist materialistic ideology amongst the Goyim, a la Gentiles. And then it says it's necessary to dismiss as an enemy whoever has alienated those who are devoted to the church or persuaded any rich person or any person well disposed to leave. And also it's necessary to dismiss those who show greater affection for their relatives when disposing of their property. So if someone wants to leave their house to their child, for example, then this society will not accept them and dismiss them as an enemy for simply wanting to give their own property to their children. Um, and personally, when I was looking at this, the first thing I thought of was that this is the binding of the tares right here, because obviously these the, they're they're taking in people that are really evil and 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 making enemies of those that are actually good people. And I mean, it, it just immediately reminded me of Matthew 13, which says, "Gather first the tares and bind them in bundles." to burn them. In other words, bind them in bundles in order to burn them. I mean, that's symbolic, but we know these texts are telling us a nuclear event is coming. That's the burning. And some will, a great multitude will be saved from that, a multitude that can't be counted. But before that, the tares, the bad seed will be bound together in bundles. So I mean, that's, that's just what this seems like to me. Because um, if you continue reading this, you'll see they, they're di dismissing good people and keeping the bad. Number 16. When the hour strikes for our sovereign Lord of the entire world to be crowned, and that is Satan, by the way, their influence will banish everything that might stand in his way. I'll read that again. When the hour strikes for our sovereign Lord of the entire world to be crowned, their influence will banish everything that might stand in his way. Um, so they dismiss those who care for their relatives right here. And then not only that, they actually harass those people. Um, it says, okay, those people that care about their relatives, well, we'll we're going to dismiss them. Um, but, but that they may not afterwards complain of the cause of their dismissal, which was that they cared for their own family, then... Um, let them not be dismissed immediately. Instead, let them be harassed with chapters and public censures and let them be restrained from recreation and con conversation with strangers. Let them be deprived until they are driven to murmuring and then let them be dismissed as persons pernicious to others by bad example. Number 17. Use systematic deception, high-sounding phrases, 
and popular slogans. The opposite of what has been promised can always be done afterwards. That is of no consequence. I'll read that one again. Use systematic deception, high-sounding phrases, and popular slogans. The opposite of what has been promised can always be done afterwards. That is of no consequence. In other words, promise anything they want. You don't have to deliver. You'll already be elected, or selected, rather. Then it goes on. It says they will also do this kind of thing to those who know their secrets. First, let them be persuaded to promise in writing that they will never write or speak anything injurious to the society. But at the same time, let the superiors preserve in writing their evil inclinations, failings, and vices, which they themselves have at some time given according to the custom of the society. So it's talking about their confessions right there. Um, their, their Catholic confessions will be used against them. Number 18, a reign of terror is the most economical way to bring about speedy subjection. I mean, that says that at all, if you consider the last 15 years, 17 years since 9-11, including 9-11. Then it says, um, it says, this is what's done to those who simply know their secrets and are dismissed. I mean, they might not even tell anyone the secrets their whole life, but just because they know some of the secrets, this is what is done to them. It says they are discredited and harassed um, simply because somebody suspected that they might tell the secrets later, not because they actually did anything. And by, and, um, by the way, this is still happening in our own day and age. I Number 19, masquerade as political, financial, and economic advisors to carry out our mandates with diplomacy and without fear of exposing the secret powers behind national and international affairs. I'll read that again. Masquerade as political, financial, and economic advisors to carry out our mandates with diplomacy and without fear of exposing the secret power behind national and international affairs really says it all right there and then it says right here outright what they're doing is suppression so let me just let me just read through here it says it must be contrived that we may keep up an intimate correspondence with someone in the family in which the dismissed reside and as soon as anything is discovered blamable or deserving as censure let it be spread amongst the common people by means of persons of inferior degree who are attached to us so we're going to have somebody from the church spy on them Hopefully somebody in their own family, <laughs> but it, you know, if not, they're probably going to use somebody else. And if something bad is discovered, we're going to, we're going to tell everybody in the community. And then it says, but if they commit nothing worthy of censure and conduct themselves in a praiseworthy manner, then let their virtues and actions, which are deserving of commendation, be depreciated by subtle insinuations and doubtful expressions until the esteem and confidence, which is attached to them, is diminished. So basically, if you can't find anything bad on them, just make it up. You know, just, just imply that they're doing bad things. Number 20, ultimate world government is the goal. Ever heard of one, our one world order, a new world order, one world government? That's it, number 20. Again, ultimate world government is the goal. It will be necessary to establish huge monopolies so even the largest fortunes of the Goyim, Gentiles, will depend on us to such an extent that they will go to the bottom together with the credit of their governments on the day after the great political smash. And then it just outright admits that it's suppression, that that's what they're doing. Number 21. Use economic warfare. Rob the Goyim, a la Gentiles, of their landed properties and industries with a combination of high taxes and unfair competition. And then it's, it talks about recruiting the men, let them, um, let them associate with us, taking care that familiarity does not produce contempt. Well, I mean, why would it produce contempt unless they knew that, some, that what they were doing was bad? Number 22, make the goyim destroy each other so there will only be the proliterate left in the world with a few millionaires devoted to our cause and sufficient police and soldiers to protect our interest. And then it says, showing publicly a contempt for riches. So even though they're trying to gather wealth, they want everybody else to think, oh, they're not interested in that. Number 23, call it the new, new order. Sorry, call it the new order. Appoint a dictator. A dictator. Not a president, a dictator. 
Anyway. Oh, here's a good one. Um, after they, they manipulate the wealth out of those widows, it says they're, it's necessary to be more resolute, to act more resolutely and sternly with widows and other persons who have given most of their property to the society. So basically manipulate them into giving all their wealth and then treat them badly after that. Number 24, fool, bemused, and corrupt the younger members of society by teaching them theories and principles we know to be false. Again, fool, bemused, and corrupt the younger members of society by teaching them theories and principles we know to be false. Um, and they talk about their methods of advancing the society. Number 25, twist national and international laws into contradiction, which first masks the law and afterwards hides it all together. Substitute arbitration for law. I definitely have to read that one again. Twist national and international laws into contradiction, which first masks the law and afterwards hides it all together. Substitute arbitration for law. Let that sink in for a while. It's a mouthful right there. And then this, this at the end talks about the vows that their members take. I thought it was sort of strange how it says peculiar care in the education of boys. I'm not sure what that means. Then they promise special obedience to the Pope, um, blindly following whatever they're told to do by their superior, who they believe holds the place of Christ. And in this one, this person is vowing to depose and kill all the kings and princes who don't believe in their ideology. So we all know Pope Francis is the first Jesuit pope. So um, we're just, there it is. That's, that's what the Jesuit agenda was hundreds of years ago, um, at least part of it. And we've had ex-Jesuits come out recently and say that they were instructed to infiltrate Christian churches. So that's part of their agenda as well. Okay. So you just heard the 25. And again, that was the 25 points that Mayor M. Shell Bauer outlined on how to accomplish gaining control of wealth, natural resources, and manpower of the entire world. Think about that. Anyhow, Bauer later changed his name to Rothschild, which means Red Shield. He took it from the red sign, which hung outside his place of business. The eagle was clutching five golden arrows in its claws. It was supposed to symbolize his five sons. Presently, the Red Shield represents the official coat of arms of the city of Frankfurt, Germany. Later on, each of the five sons were dispatched to a major city in Europe to establish a branch of the Rothschild banking firm. Son number one, Amschel, remained in Frankfurt and propelled Germany to financial success under Bismarck. Son number two, Solomon, went to Vienna, Austria, and he became a leader in the Austria-Hungary empire. Number three, son Nathan Meyer, went to England where he took control of the Bank of England. Number four son, Carl, went to Naples where he became the most powerful man in Italy through his banking skills. And the number five son, James Jacob, went to Paris where he established the central bank. He was credited with dominating the financial destiny of the nation of France. Now by 1850, the House of Rothschilds represented more wealth than all the families of Europe. Shortly after he formed the Bank of England, William Patterson lost control of it to Nathan Rothschild. And here's how he did it. Nathan Rothschild was an observer of the day the Duke of Wellington defeated Napoleon at Waterloo, Belgium. He knew that with this information, he could make a fortune. He later paid a sailor to a big fee to take him across the English Channel in bad weather. The news of Napoleon's defeat would take a while to hit England. When Nathan arrived in London, he began selling securities and bonds in a panic. The other investors were deceived into believing that Napoleon won the war and was eyeing England, so they began to sell their securities too. What they weren't aware of is that Rothschild's agents were buying all the securities that were being sold in a panic. Now, in one day, the Rothschild's fortune grew by one million pounds. They literally bought control of England for a few cents on the dollar. The same way the Rockefellers went into Japan 
after World War II and bought everything that's 10 cents on the dollar. Everyone's familiar with the word Sony, S-O-N-Y, how big of a company that is? Well, it equals Standard Oil New York, S-O-N-Y, Standard Oil New York, a Rockefeller company. Talk about hiding in plain sight. Frederick Morton wrote in his book, The Rothschilds, the wealth of the Rothschilds consists of the bankruptcy of nations. Think about that. In order for them to get wealthy, they have to bankrupt nations, and they've done it for a long time. There were other wealthy families in Europe and America which were allowed to join the International Banking Club, such as John D. Rockefeller and John Pierpont Morgan. You probably know him better as J.P. Morgan, rather. As in J.P. Morgan Chase. Anyway, so that wraps up the Amschel Bowers 25-point plan on how to accomplish possibly gaining control of wealth, natural resources, and manpower of the entire world. And it seems like he accomplished just that. And at the same time, I managed to splice together in the mix the uh, Monita Secreta, the uh, secret instruction of the Jesuits. Again, that was written back in the 16th century. Anyway, you I may have said 15th century, but it's definitely the 16th century. To give us some kind of idea of what their whole agenda was to gain power for the Catholic Church and ultimately the entire world. Oh, please, hold your applause. No, really. Now, before I wrap up this video, I just wanted to ask you guys something. Regarding that 10 bank list that make up the Federal Reserve, did you notice anything missing? Now, some of you may be asking, where's the federal government? Well, that's a simple question to answer. They don't get a dime. They don't get a cent. They can be called the Federal Reserve all they want, and all it is is a rouge for people to think it's... It's time to wake up, people. The Federal Reserve is illegal, plain and simple. And our impotent Congress refuses to do what is right and abolish the Fed. But they would rather allow us to remain in bondage forever. Democrats and Republicans, two sides of the same coin. They're useless entities because they are both bought and paid for by the bankers. This is your wake up call. So if you've been following me throughout my short-lived YouTube career, you know how I end my videos. If not me, who? And if not now, when? Stay vigilant and fear no evil. God bless.